Hello everyone, Mike Rubano again from the Chicago Audio Collective. We're going to have an uh, in-depth description of the work that was done on this Columbia Masterwork 866. We started with the record changer, which is a Garrard RC88-4 unit, which was originally outfitted with a GE mono variable reluctance cartridge with a turnover stylus so that it can play LPs and 78s. Uh, since this is not a stereo unit, Later on, a stereo cartridge was fitted into a new head shell with the right and left channels married together so that they could play stereo records, although they might not necessarily hear the stereo effect. It has a pusher-type platform automatic spindle mechanism with a, uh, an available automatic 45 RPM spindle and also manual spindles for both LPs and 45s. And in the case of this device, in order to make it work properly, I completely disassembled it. I also disassembled the motor cleaned all of the parts, lubricated them with the appropriate materials, reassembled the whole thing, and I was able to calibrate it on the bench, then bring it back here, reinstall it in the machine, and calibrate it here so that it works absolutely perfectly and smoothly, just as it did when it was new. Uh, that also included a remolded idler wheel and a new stylus for the stereo cartridge. Uh, the mono cartridge didn't get much use, neither did the 78, so we were able to retain those, but it plays all types of records beautifully. Behind this panel is pretty much everything else, uh, starting with the AM-FM receiver, which performs beautifully. Um, it's a very technically advanced piece of equipment, which uh, we'll describe later in a document that's going to be attached. But suffice to say that this uh, has no trouble picking up distant stations and sounds gorgeous. It has a flywheel tuner. Of course, this is the band switch, which changes the lighting of the graduated scale when you turn it. And an adjustable AFC for the FM, which was quite unique, makes it uh, very easy to tune, and it holds onto stations without drift. The next part of the circuit, which is kind of its heart, is the control panel. It starts out with a graphic equalizer with bass, treble, and makeup gain controls, which is represented by this graph, which is actually a mechanical apparatus strung together with strings and pulleys such that when you are raising the bass or treble or the overall gain, you can see the whole apparatus moves. The scale is reticulated, meaning it has lines cut into it, which are edge lit, and it's calibrated in decibels, plus 60, minus 60. And it's absolutely accurate. It's phenomenal. I've never seen anything like this in a piece of domestic equipment, but uh, it, cost was no object, and there it is. And the second part of this control unit is this push button panel which is an equalization panel. At the time this unit was made, there were a number of different equalization curves for LP records. Engineers had discovered early on that recording a record flat wasn't such a good idea. Too much bass would knock the needle out of the groove, and uh, too much high end would just end up sounding like noise. So what they decided very early on was to cut the bass in recording, boost the treble, and then conversely, boost the bass and cut the treble upon playback. The question was, what frequency and by how much? So there was a bit of a format war. This machine covers all of those equalization curves with this push button panel. So you press these various panels to coincide with the equalization curve of the record used by the record label. And then you wonder, well, how do I know which one is appropriate? Well, the instruction booklet has a guide with all of the popular labels at that time and which button should be pressed. And in addition to that, the owner of this machine created a chart for himself so that he had all of the records in his collection covered as far as the equalization curves so that when the records were played back, the recordings sounded just like when they were made at the session. In addition to that, there are two calibrated scratch filters here and here. And they pop because the circuit is being charged, so they're, they're active at all time. These are only active when you're playing a record. So in a, if, if the record still has too much scratch or you're listening to something on the radio that's kind of scratchy, you can put one of those in or take it out. Down here, just, just because they could, each one of the uh, on indicators has a different colored light for phono, tape, etc. cetera, um, just because they could. This is your master volume. There's an input for an auxiliary, an input for a microphone, that's the microphone level control. So you can sing along with music and some other things we'll talk about in a second. 
And as they used to say, but wait, there's more. In addition to all of this, it has an oscilloscope, the purpose of which is to help you tune AM, help you tune FM, set your recording levels. We'll talk about that in a second. And just to watch the waveform dance and impress your friends, just because we could. Then, in addition to that, it has a clock timer so that you can set a time for it to go on and set a time a number of hours later for it to go off. So the whole thing can be set to turn on and turn off. And it can also be set to start the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. It has a two-speed deck, which, of course, records any of the sources that you just saw, including the microphone and the auxiliary. It will, of course, play back. It plays back beautifully and is controlled by the clock timer. So you can set it up to record a radio broadcast or what, what have you. Automatically, it will just begin running and record, and then a number of hours later, shut itself off. And like the t uh, turntable, the tape deck, I fully rebuilt it by disassembling it, cleaning all the components, very similar to the turntable. A new set of molded idler wheels, some belts were needed, and a very thorough cleaning. It had a lot of hours on it. Uh, the heads were in pretty good shape. I'm thinking they may have been replaced at one time, but in any event, it's uh, in like-new condition and works beautifully, records quite well, and has a unique feature that, although it only records in mono, it can play back in stereo through an accessory cabinet, which was matched to this furniture, which had its own set of speakers, amplifier, and control. So this device is pretty rare. Imagine how rare that must be. There aren't too many of those tapes around. But uh, one day we'll find it, and if we do, we'll, we'll take a video of it. So below all of this, this comprises the speaker cabinet. There are two 12-inch Jensen P-Series Alnico 5 speakers here and here. There is a port about there, which is a calculated opening for the frequency response of these speakers. And right up here is a compression driver, also a Jensen unit, with a simple but effective crossover network. So unlike most consoles, there are no electronics in this chamber. All the electronics are in here, including the amplifier, which is kind of located back there. Can't really see it, but it's near the rear of the chassis. Um, the cabinet, as I said, is sealed with a acoustic insulation and is uh, wired in with a, with a crossover network and sounds gorgeous, and you'll hear that later. But it's very unique to consoles of that era. Usually, it's in some empty space. We can put some components in there and save money and space and so on and so forth, but this is a relatively high-end piece of equipment. They wanted it to sound right as well as look right sealed speaker cabinet. And uh, when I say it was a, a rare and expensive piece of equipment, it ran about $1,600 brand new in 1957, which a uh, quick internet search tells us you'd have enough money to buy a brand new Volkswagen and enough money to buy half of another one. So it's not cheap. And with all those equalization buttons and all the various other features, you really had to know music and know what you were doing to bring one of these home. Um, like the record changer and the tape deck, the electronics got a different refurbishment depending on each chassis. Uh, the tuner, the amplifier, the control unit, and the oscilloscope are all on separate chassis. Each one needed a little bit of work and needed a lot of tubes because it had a lot of hours on it. The people who owned this loved it, and they played it and played it and played it. So it was kind of pooped out, but uh, still in pretty good shape. And uh, since it never lived in a basement or an attic, it wasn't in the condition of some of those guitar amplifiers that you've seen in some of our other videos. Uh, no home for mice, nothing like that. But um, we're going to hear a little bit about uh, its cabinet and other features, and then we're going to hear itself, uh, the great sound that it produces very shortly. Mm -hmm. 